to my master class for A226 from Victor Polish Advanced Studies for the Clarinet. Today we're covering a wonderful study in the style of the Tombeau de Couperin by Maurice Ravel. And as always, I love to give just a little bit of background on the larger works that these are written after just to have some context before we jump into the actual music. Uh, composed in 1917, Le Tombeau de Couperin was originally written for piano um, using modern sensibilities paired with accents of the 18th century. Uh, Ravel described this as an homage, uh, less in fact to Couperin himself, uh, another composer, than to the French music of the actual 18th century. In this work, Ravel fused both rhythmic and melodic forms, uh, cadences of Couperin's time with those of his own. There's a lot of crossover in this work. The work conveys a sense of the present as a perennially open dialogue with the past. If you haven't heard of this work, it's beautiful. It's one of my favorites. Um, never got to play an orchestra, but the piano version is also beautiful from which it's also derived. Um, out of all those works, the 1919 orchestration stands out as probably the most uh, popular, uh, one of the most superb orchestrations, crisp tone colors, incisive the rhythms, precise melodic contours, are given a nice modern harmonic twist. In this etude, we're working with the theme from the oboe solo that begins the prelude, the first movement, uh, meanders through uh, fast intervals, through the texture of the full orchestra, very elegant, very lush, beautiful, impressionistic. Uh, as I said, one of my favorite orchestral works, and I'm so excited that Polacek decided to pick this as one of the 28 etudes in this book. Now getting into the music, this etude is scored in B-flat major, 6-8 time, with a tempo suggestion of molto vivace. Uh, based on this indication, I'd suggest a performance tempo of dotted half note equals 92 or so, just as the original tempo marking in the orchestral work. Uh, playing this material in one, also thinking of bigger beats, so one beat per measure. Um, the original work, I believe, is scored in 1216, so we can use the same tempo and apply the same sense of pulse, even though the engraving has been adjusted to a different meter for this book. Uh, as mentioned just now, the writing in this A2 that, and the material that we're working with is based on the oboe solo from the first movement, the prelude, uh, meandering through fast intervals in the texture of the full orchestra. Um, if you've heard the original work, you can definitely hear the inspiration from the minute this etude starts. Uh, given the key of B flat major, the shift in tonality automatically presents some more clarinet specific hurdles that will make this a bit more challenging to play at the same tempo and style. So given the technical demands of this motive being used throughout the etude, I believe the main objective for this etude is going to be creating expressive legato lines in a challenging technical style. Uh, as I said in previous studies in B flat major, it may not seem like the most difficult key center to play in, but it does present some challenges that we'll cover in just a minute. All in all, I would say when playing this A2, try to make sure that you are being as expressive as possible, even though the writing of the music errs on the technical side. With A2s like this, I find that they're often some of the most rewarding to play because they force us to work on both the technique and expression equally. So starting at the beginning of this A2, let's take a look at the way this A2 has been structured and composed. Uh, Ravel's style is often described as impressionistic with neoclassical features. Uh, I think he certainly works within the outer edges of tonal harmony as well. Uh, in this work, Le Tombe de Couperin, the prelude fits such a description, but with the addition of additional elements of early 20th century style. Uh, the 20th century style adds ostinato motives and sometimes extremely harsh dissonances. Obviously, we can't hear those dissonances in the etude, but if you listen to the larger work, you can definitely hear that flavor in that. Uh, in the original work, the oboe starts with a fast, on-the-beat, upper mordant that later becomes an on-the-beat lower mordant with exactly the same quick on-the-beat rhythm. And then we jump into the theme that we have in this etude. So this is kind of the second part of that oboe solo. It's been expanded into three stepwise 16th notes um, or eighth notes in this etude and is followed by many runs, um, sometimes scalar, um, often arpeggiated. Uh, in the context of this study, we're gonna be working with eighth notes that are grouped and arpeggiated grouped as ascending and descending sequences that travel throughout several modulations. Warming up, I would suggest practicing all forms of your major and minor arpeggios and scales, really focusing on the hand position of the left hand, particularly the thumb and the index finger. We have a lot of B flats that we're going through, so these two fingers really have to be in sync for this to work as well as it can. 
Now when practicing this etude, I started with a very slow tempo of dotted half note equals 50 to thoroughly understand the technical demands that are needed to play this music well. Uh, like I said, a lot of this really comes down to a couple fingers that are super critical, the index finger in the left hand and the thumb, operating the B flat four, right in the middle of the staff that's being meandered through a lot of this etude. Uh, we're going through a lot of notes in the middle of the staff to throw tones. So really understanding the register relationships is gonna be the key to gain really smooth intervals and fast technique with confidence. Uh, starting in measure one, the opening melody begins with a line in the throat tone register meandering through several B flat fours. So as a rule of thumb, for instances that use all these throat tones, make sure to keep that right hand down to vent these tone holes if and when possible. It's gonna really save you time with finger motion. It'll add facility, the intonation will improve, the timbre, and it's also much easier going across the break for these longer notes that fall on the middle of the staff. Second tip for this etude, more often than not, we're gonna be making the use of our left C5 to our right E5 5 for the majority of this music. So as you work through this etude, try to keep that present in the back of your head. Uh, for me, I always seem to default to wanting to use my right C5 more often than not, so this is a really good way to get more comfortable with using this more interchangeably. Um, so I would set that as your default. Regarding phrase structure, I'm keeping the oboe solo in the back of my head as well from the original work. In general, I'm really striving to keep the slur groupings very expansive, lyrical, elegant. Uh, for the main theme, adding direction on the second half of each note grouping. Um, and also growing in dynamic intensity with the contour of the line. Uh, since we are playing with an impressionistic style, you can definitely take more liberties with your interpretation. You can add more tenudo, tenudos, uh, more rubato if you like. There's definitely opportunity to take time with this since we're playing in a very lush impressionistic style, as I said. So think about uh, Debussy, Ravel, um, try to get that flavor. This doesn't need to be super precise like Mozart or Bach. We're really trying to create a nice soundscape uh, think of Monet's paintings, uh, you get the picture. So a few more tips as we're getting through this etude and the concepts and the structure. I measure 20, the motive is now slightly different, this time in groupings of two to four. For these instances, I'm adding a bit more length to the first two notes and then growing through the next four. In measure 37, we have reached the B theme of this etude, the development structured as a series of descending arpeggios. For this phrase and other instances that are similar, I would place greater emphasis on the first note of each grouping to outline the stepwise motion. Uh, measure 48 and onward, this writing is technically dense for the clarinet due to the registers that we're playing between. So in general, I would try to keep the finger motion your top priority, really making sure that the left hand index finger and the thumb, as I've said a couple times before, are really in check, making sure that those E flats and the B flats in the right hand index finger are also precise. Uh, there's a lot of cross fingers in this as well, so hand position is going to take you a long way. If you'd like more instruction and tips on hand position, check out my third master class from Scheherazade uh, by Nikolai Grimsky Korsakov. So one thing that helped me a lot and one thing that helped you a lot is maybe just thinking this in a bigger picture, a different context. Um, you might want to think of this as a violinist, how they would bow large, even strokes against the strings. Uh, instead of overthinking the notes, try and think of larger ideas, um, particularly um, halfway down the first page and then onward. With these groupings of three, I'm thinking of upward and downward bow strokes, uh, again, larger movements, bigger ideas, trying not to get so caught up in the note-to-note -note motion as much as the larger arpeggio groupings. Um, I know the technique is really dense, but the idea of this etude is to really challenge us to smooth out those intervals, get the air moving between the notes, and understand the relationship between the air and our clarinet, and our tendencies to really get this sounding as beautiful and as seamless as possible. You might also want to check out the piano recording of this, um, just for stylistic nuance. Uh, as a pianist, they don't have to worry about air, so it might be a good idea to listen to the way that they're phrasing, just so you have an idea of how to communicate that through the clarinet as well. And with that, we've reached the end of A226 in Victor Polachek's Advanced Studies with Clarinet. Having reached the end of this masterclass, I hope you've gained a little bit of knowledge that prepares you for a beautiful performance in the future. In case you have any additional questions on this A2, as always, please feel free to reach out or comment below. In the meantime, thank you so much for clicking today, and I'll see you next time for the last two A2s in this series. 
Happy practicing, stay safe, and see you again soon.